Wonderful. Well, again, I'm Jennifer Stokes. I'm the Managing Director of Development at RMI. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for today's webinar. And as all of us at RMI live to work our mission to transform the global energy system to secure a clean, prosperous, zero carbon future for all, it is our supporters and partners, all of you who are joining us today, uh, your investments and your commitments who help us do this work together. A special thank you to our Solutions Council and Innovator Circle funders. We have many of you on the call today, and your support makes RMI's work possible, including the efforts of our panelists in this discussion. And we're especially pleased to welcome attendees from 20 countries and 33 states at least. Uh, so going to the next slide, today, uh, as we talk through our program, I'm very excited that John Kreitz, our new CEO at RMI, is joining us today as our moderator. He will share some exciting updates from across the Institute and really lead our discussion with our panelists. John began as RMI's new CEO on November 1st, following an extensive global search. He takes on this role with 10 years of programmatic leadership experience at RMI most recently serving as RMI's Chief Program and Strategy Officer. John forged new initiatives, including launching our China program, many of our market affiliates, and building the capacity to empower leaders and actions across multiple sectors and geographies. While John utilized his mechanical engineering PhD at the likes of Lockheed Martin and built market knowledge at McKinsey Consulting, his path is devoted to the clean energy transition. He has a combination of a powerful intellect, his passion and his heart for, for our planet, and a drive for an equitable global energy transition that makes every single one of us at RMI excited for his leadership. I also have the pleasure of introducing you to three emerging leaders at RMI who are directing key global initiatives. Joining us today are Rizki Fabuzianto, Manager for Southeast Asia on the Global South team. He's been central to the recently lost, launched Just Energy Transition Partnership, JetP, that will help transition Indonesia from coal to renewables. Mahalat Iaso Melke, Senior Associate with the Climate Finance Access Network. She works each day to unlock and accelerate climate finance at scale by deploying highly trained climate finance advisors to supplement the capacity in developing economies. And Rose Wan, Manager in Climate Intelligence. She led the release of the new Oil Climate Index plus Gas Action Tool, which quantifies greenhouse gas emissions from the global oil and gas sector so investors, policymakers, and the public can make informed choices. After their discussion, we'll have about 20 minutes to answer your questions. Please submit your questions anytime during the conversation by entering them into the Q&A function and we'll get to as many as we can during the, the 20 minute answer and question portion. And then our team will follow up with any additional answers to questions that we didn't have time to get to. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. I now will turn it over to RMI CEO, John Kreitz. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you all for joining us here and for your partnership. You know, I, I could start out by talking about floods and fires or hurricanes and heat waves. But, but really, uh, as Amory, our founder often said, you can't depress anyone to, into action. But I do think there's one number right now that we all need to be aware of, and that's 50%, right? There's a 50% chance here in the next five years that we actually tip one and a half degrees, even if temporarily. And we know that one and a half degrees is an important marker. It's an important mark where physical systems in the environment start changing in dramatic ways. And, and we need to do everything that we can in order to, to hold to the greatest extent possible our climate within that one and a half degree mark. And so we're tapping right on the edge of that. RMI as an institution is leading the clean energy transition to secure a clean, prosperous, and zero carbon future for all. And today you're gonna to hear a little bit about how we're doing that. If we go to the next page, what you see right now is how we're, we as an institution are, are designed and, and the strategy that we're executing is a portfolio. 
We're currently active in 61 countries globally, with an emphasis in particular on some of the biggest economies in the world, like the United States and China and India, that simply have to, have to adopt clean energy in order for us to, to stay within that one and a half degree future, but also working in, in emblematic and important countries throughout the world that can lead in different ways. We, within those countries, we do two important things. We focus on changing out that infrastructure and driving deep decarbonization, right? Of the electricity space, of the built environment, of our industrial production capacity and our mobility and transport systems. And we do that using what we call market catalysts. These are kind of cross-cutting capabilities and capacities that, that allow us in the end to drive change within those individual sectors, right? And those include things like, yes, policy, of course, and, and RMI was heavily involved in the Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, here in the United States that was recently passed. That was an, is an extraordinary opportunity to mobilize capital to drive uh, large scale cost reductions in clean energy technologies. And we work in technologies, right? And how we create, for instance, the the two to three Tesla scale innovations that we're going to need this year and every, every year for the next 30 years. We work in finance to help mobilize the three to five trillion dollars, right? With a T, <laughs> that's a lot of money that we're going to need here, right? From a combination of, of public and private funds in order to install and upgrade all of that infrastructure across the global economy. We work on issues like how to make emissions visible. And you'll hear Rose talk a bit about that today um, on how do we see with clarity where methane emissions or CO2 emissions are happening and thereby allow us to price them in the market, right? How do we uh, also engage then in building the capacity or the leadership capacity? And, and here recently at COP, we, we announced and, and started working very heavily on our Energy uh, Transition Academy, which is really focused on helping to grow the capacity of low and middle income countries in the global south uh, to help them choose the energy transition pathway that makes the most sense for them. And then we, we work and use communications in the end to lift all those messages and ensure that we can drive as much change as possible globally. We know any one of those things can help make a step change and when we line them all up together in our think and do and scale model, we can actually drive large scale tippings of markets that allow us to get to that clean energy future faster, the one that we all want to need. If we go to the next page. So RMI, as we think about all the different things that we do, we focus on first doing the things where RMI has the expertise. And for us, the expertise is around energy. Energy is two thirds of the problem here globally, um, it's gotta be two thirds of the solution in the end. We uh, assess uh, and understand where, when we stay in our lane, our knowledge of, of deep technology insights, um, uh, where and how we can influence the system alongside others that have complementary uh, capabilities. And we communicate that. Then at the next stage, we look very specifically at impact, right? In the end, we've got to take tons out of the system. We've got to reduce the amount of methane and the amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. So we, we ultimately guide ourselves based on where we can have that greatest impact. And we relentlessly monitor to make sure that we are indeed producing the overall impacts that we hope. And then finally, we know we can't get to 100%. We can't get to that energy solution unless the solution works for everyone. Right, And so we focus very much on uh, adding a final lens of equity and inclusion in our work. And all the things that, that we consider pass through these different screens, and if they make it through all four, they become part of our portfolio. So today, you're gonna hear some amazing work by three different emerging leaders that was featured in COP in different ways and has been growing our influence and impact here globally. Um, and so I'd like to uh, turn it over and, and start a dialogue here. So if we could take down uh, the, the projection. 
I'd, I'd love to um, begin a conversation with Risky, uh, Mahalet, and Rose here. And maybe, maybe to start out with Risky, um, you know, just maybe introduce yourself a bit to our audience here. What, what brought you to RMI? And, and in particular, share a little bit about your work over the past year. Yes, thank you very much, John. A very good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. I'm currently the manager in Southeast Asia program and also specifically manage Indonesia portfolio as country manager. What brought me to RMI is when I was working in GIZ as a team leader for ASEAN German Energy program, I had a chance to have a meeting with uh, RMI Southeast Asia teams where they were looking for potential collaboration with GIZ in Southeast Asia. I learned more on RMI vision for the Global South program. And from that point, I know RMI in the future will be another big player in this region with their global expertise. And I'm sure RMI will start to set their footprint in this in the near time. It was proven not long time until 2020 when I heard RMI's name again and made me brought to RMI as I realized RMI team for Southeast Asia was limited and maybe not so familiar with the regions uh, on the actors, on the activity and how to approach the stakeholders. This is where I can greatly support RMI while also helping my regions to be a better place to live in. Prior to RMI, I worked as a team leader in GIZ where I managed like eight stops with 7 million euro activities and projects. And I was working in Germany in a gas company and also research institutions uh, for biogas from palm oil. And early of my career, I also was a banker in the Indonesian state owned bank. I would say my expertise is a project management, business development, and stakeholder engagement with some deep technical and grid integrations. This is aligned with the current work in RMI, where I work in Southeast Asia program under the Global South uh, Big Umbrella. The program focuses on three countries in the region, which is Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam, with three focus components on clean energy portfolio, demonstration projects, and energy leaderships. Particular on the clean energy portfolio in Indonesia, we are currently working with the ministries, utilities, and also financial state owned on the techno-economic analysis for early retirement and replacement of coal uh, for the few coal fired power plant assets since early of this year. We are involved in the discussion with both Indonesia and the US government on the coal phase up, which finally resulted on the Just Energy Transition Partnership, or JETP, we call it, announcement that was we heard in G20 three weeks ago. Larger than the jet fee for South Africa last year, for Indonesia is a package of 20 billion US dollar channeled to Indonesia energy transition mechanism platform to retire the coal power plant and transform it to clean energy. The commitment consists of 10 billion US dollar for the G7 countries led by US and Japan and another 10 billion US dollar from private financial institutions. Specific on our involvement in jet fee, we are involved and sit in the center with the minister, with the government, with the utility to provide our analysis to estimate how much the coal retirement costs with and without RE as replacements, which will be important to know how much funding is needed from the private financing and the public financing. I guess that's what brought me to RMI and what I've worked on for the past year. Back to you, John. Thanks, Risky. That is such an amazing outcome, right? And we're so, one, happy that you're here with RMI. But when I think about $20 billion that, that RMI was instrumental, and you particularly were helping to do some of the analysis and work with stakeholders there uh, to tee up uh, that level of funding to help Indonesia make the transition off coal to renewables is just astounding. So thank you. We'll come back and talk more about how we scale that here in a minute. But but first, I, I'd love to engage you in the conversation, Mahalat. And I, I know you've been involved in finance from a different angle here, but tell us a little bit about your background. What brought you to RMI? And, and in particular, what's over the past year, what's been exciting you? Okay, and thank you, John. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so I've known about RMI's Climate Finance Access Network program from its conception stage when there was a consultation taking place with different governments and stakeholders. And back then, in my previous role as a climate finance policy analyst, I was working very closely with the least developed countries, supporting them in the United Nations negotiations with a particular focus on climate finance and also supporting different uh, least developed countries, uh, Green Climate Fund board representatives in the structure, governance, and also implementation of the board's policies. So I decided to, because I understand that access is one of the biggest challenges for developing countries, 
even with the limited finance or resources that is available, access is also a big challenge. So I decided to focus more on access and really work towards implementation and decided to join RMI. So in the past year, since I joined RMI, I've been working, leading the thought leadership work of RMI and also work as a senior associate, as you have introduced me, John. So at the Climate Finance Access Network, you know, it was established to build lasting capacities in the small island states and the African least developed countries, which are the most vulnerable and also the most capacity constrained countries to help them to unlock and accelerate climate finance to supplement their already existing capacities in developing countries and governments. So what we do at the Climate Finance Access Network is we recruit and hire locally, and we train these recruited, um, highly skilled climate finance advisors so that we embed them in different uh, governments in developing countries. And these advisors will be developing high quality projects and also work towards building lasting national capacity for these countries. So as I've mentioned this year only, we have embedded eight advisors in eight Pacific countries who have received a multi-month training. And as of September, 2022, they have submitted 10 concept notes and funding proposals that is worth about 50 million USD that has been submitted. So, I mean, as I mentioned, this figure is uh, from uh, September, but we expect this figure to be higher by the end of the year when we get this updated figure. Um, and also with the thought leadership, uh, I've been focusing, working on the new collective quantified goal that is a new finance goal that will be set up in 2024. So I've been working on that as well. We can get into that in the next sessions. Yeah. Thank you, John. Wonderful. It's uh, the Climate Finance Access Network. It's just, it's an amazing idea that seems to be growing. We could talk, there was a big announcement at COP here where the Canadian government re-upped and, and basically doubled the amount of funding for it. Very exciting, and we'll get more into that in a moment, but thank you, Mahalet. Um, uh, Rose, uh, um, tell us a little bit about your journey to RMI, and in particular, what's exciting you right now? What have you been working on over the last year? Thank you, John. Um, I studied undergrad um, graduate, stu uh, graduate studies all in environmental science and engineering. Um, so I also had developed a deep interest in data analytics during my PhD. And I worked in Singapore government on green building policy standards, regulation. And um, afterwards I worked on a project uh, called Extractives Hub, which is a knowledge platform. I was a project manager on that project. Uh, I was always looking for a, a field that I can apply my deep analytics knowledge into sustainability. So when I saw this job, um, that is about applying data science into um, oil and gas emission reduction and uh, involve some kind of project management experience. I think this is the job I want to apply. And I'm so glad I made the decision um, because every day I'm on this job, I'm incredibly proud to work with a talented team of colleagues on, on this mission of reducing emissions in the oil and the gas sector. Um, oil and the gas sector is... The, the one of the hardest to abate sectors in the uh, in the world. Uh, it's very important in emission reduction because it sits on the very upstream of the supply chain, not only in terms of energy, like the, the gas we use every day in our houses and the materials we use um, in our day-to-day -day product, like the plastic, um, plastic bottle that we use, um, and also the car, tires, the uh, hair dyer, it's everywhere. Whenever you see anything, it has petroleum products in it. So the importance of oil and the gas in this sector makes it, um, makes it, you know, our mission very important to reduce the climate footprint by, um, you know, making the emissions data available to the globe, to, to the whole world. We want to be able to differentiate different oil and the gas assets, climate impact, 
by modeling them, by incorporating satellite observations into our modeling work so that we can see what are the you know, disparity of impact of climate, uh, of carbon dioxide among all those oil and gas resources around the world. So my um, past year's um, focus is mainly on this project called Oil Climate Index Plus Gas or OCI Plus in short. Uh, if you go to the website ocplus.imi.org, you can explore this web tool and um, see what kind of um, emission visibility this tool has um, uh, has um, has reviewed. And you can um, go to different pages to see what are the total emissions for all the oil and the gas resources we modeled um, in terms of megatons of CO2 or kilotons of methane emitted over the 2021 time horizon. You can also go to the supply chain page to see what are the uh, individual supply chains segments emission like um, production, refinery, um, transport, and, and end uses in impact along the supply chain. And you can also toggle between uh, CO2 and uh, methane to see how the industry is responsible for the lion's share, lion's share of methane emissions, which makes it you know, a bull's eyes to uh, target methane in this decisive decade. Um, so a lot of functionalities you can explore on the OCI Plus web tool. And that's kind of what my main focus at IMI last year is about. Back to you, John. Amazing. Thanks, Rose. I, one of the things that your team educated me on is there's up to a 10 times difference between a molecule of oil produced in different places in the world and in its overall greenhouse gas impacts. And I think knowing that means we have to be better about choosing the least, you know, the, the least harmful molecules here as we go forward, and even as we transition off, you know, fossil fuels eventually. Um, exactly. So let's, why don't we think a little bit about scale though? I, at RMI, we, we think of ourselves in a three-part change model where we create path-breaking thought leadership, right? We then do, right? We, we focus on um, really how, how do you create those proofs of concepts or prototypes that, that show the idea is worthwhile and, and merit worthy. And then, and then the important thing is we think about how to shift markets and, and overall get to a tipping point where this change becomes commonplace. And I know each of you are wrestling a little bit with how do you get to that scale moment? Risky, why don't you start out? You, you have a, an amazing pilot that started with Indonesia, but lots of work to get going. You're working in other countries as well. How are you thinking about scale? Yeah, I would say I'm excited on this follow up on the JP because we have done the thing and now we want to do the do and the scale part. In addition to Indonesia, we also have been approached by the government and donors to work on the Vietnam JP that may be announced next week. Uh, let's see, this JP funding uh, along with the Climate Investment Fund will, will on, also open the door for more energy transition opportunities in the country. I'm excited like for the next year because there are strong support from the philanthropies and stakeholders for us to explore on the financing on the credible coal transition for, for both climate and social perspective, as well as a renewable energy pilot project and just energy transition. There are plenty of lessons from other countries where the energy transition has not been handled well. That is why we should focus on the role for the finance to support a well-managed and smoother energy transition. Three elements I would highlight to make immediate impact for the upscale First, like to using momentum of this JP and the G20 and the country energy transition mechanism platform to develop a clear pathway for the coal transition as early as possible that allows for the planning to manage costs for the transitions and bringing a range of impacted communities like coal workers into the process. The second one, generating funding dedicated to supporting workers and the community, but also targeting the broader macroeconomic and the climate impact which will be liked or favored by the many markets and the donors. The third one, both private and public financing community can support this transition by testing solutions to better understand the potential and limitation of different approaches in different contexts, including climate and social perspective. Both public and private financing are going to be critical. Uh, as we all know, private financing will eventually make up the lion's share of this financing required to support an accelerated energy transition. However, in many markets, like in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia and Vietnam, 
public financing of many forms will be needed to help to pave the way for additional private financing. Back to you, John. Thanks, Rizki. That's a that's a wonderful segue to you, Mahalet, because you work practically on mobilizing that financing. How are you thinking about scale here? Uh, yes, thank you, John, and thank you, uh, Risky, as well, for mentioning how finance is important in implementing this. You know, like in order to achieve any climate plans or goals, especially for developing countries, readily available and also accessible finance is really crucial. And also really what we do at the Climate Finance Access Network is really to unlock this challenge of accessing finance, especially the most capacity constrained countries. And as I have mentioned, we have already started our operation in eight Pacific countries. And also, like you have mentioned, John, we also have a generous support from uh, the Canadian government to continue the support for these countries. And also we received other fundings from different philanthropies and other donors and now we're expanding to three more Pacific countries and also a regional entity that works in the Pacific with the Pacific countries. And we're very excited about this because, like I mentioned, in only a short period of time, in less than a year, 10 funding proposals and concept notes have already been submitted. And we expect this number to be higher when we do you know, final analysis by the end of this year. So we expect this to be scaled up in the coming years. And also we're going to do a piloting in the Caribbean, which will be in the Caribbean small island developing states. And after that, we also plan to expand in other Caribbean countries. And also, I mean, for the funding proposals and the concept notes that have been submitted, it's really the portfolio is cross-cutting. Most of the projects are connected to renewable energy transition. And for the most vulnerable, that is really building resilience of their economy and also their community. So this is critical for them. So also the other exciting uh, thing is also, I mean, we understand the contexts of the different geographies, you know, how it's all different, like in the from the Pacific to the Caribbean and also Africa. Now we're at the scoping stage and really advancing our plans by working with partners on the ground, specifically with the Tony Blair Institute for Africa to respond to the requests that are coming from different African countries who want to get advisors embedded in their uh, governments. So we want to do this in a tailored way and we'll be piloting and scaling into Africa in the coming year as well. So this is how we see the scaling up in the coming year. Thank you, John. Wonderful. Thanks, Mahale. Um, Rose, you're dealing with scaling in a different context rather than working country by country. You're thinking it about, about it basin by basin and, and with different assets. But talk to us a little bit about how, how do we take the data that you've been compiling and, and turn that into change? Um, yeah, John. So um, this year we will be focusing on a few aspects of the web tool to scale up. First, we will increase the amount of assets that we model. Currently, we have 135 assets that we modeled on the web tool. We will publish more than 500 assets this coming year um, with um, more than 75% of global production coverage. That is like a, a huge increase from what we're currently covering. And second, we will increase the granularity of the assets we covered. Um, in, now we're at the basin scale, but coming up, we will be increasing granular, uh, the granularity to cover at the specific field level so that we can know which operator is responsible for this particular field's emission. And thirdly, we will increase the granularity of the supply chain segments that we modeled. Currently, if you go to the web tool, you can see there are upstream, midstream, downstream segment, which imply, which, which means the production refinery and end use. And we will uh, we will actually delineate all those responsible parties in the, on the supply chain in the next, next release by uh, specify which um, components, which drivers in the production segment are actually causing the biggest emission and so on and so forth. We were adding the transport as an individual segment onto the uh, web tool. And um, in terms of, um, so that's kind of the web tool um, upscaling. We're also thinking about new ideas to um, 
track and trace the emissions along the supply chain, particularly the oil and gas supply chain. We're thinking ideas of defining nodes around the uh, supply chain. So for example, oil production will be considered as a node in, uh, and refinery will be a node and transport will be a node. So in order to track and trace the scope three emissions, which is kind of the indirect emissions for any company that need, they need to report, they have to know what are the upstream emissions uh, above me and what are the downstream emissions behind me. So um, the next step of scaling is to be able to delineate the supply chain emissions and being able to have those nodes communicate with each other to make the emissions data interoperable so that we can track and trace the emissions along the supply chain. And that's and our whole climate intelligence programs you know, mission is about is to differentiate and drive a market differentiated, uh, climate differentiated the commodity market so that the market for us can drive the uh, climate uh, mitigation. That's amazing, Rose. I, when I think about the challenges of managing all that data to kind of pull apart the, the supply chain system and understand where emissions are coming from and then allow people to understand how to account for them, it's a very tricky, but at the same time, we need that data in order to help encourage people to make the right choices, you know, that are less carbon intensive over time. Um, why don't we, I'd love to ask one more round of questions here before we open it up to the audience, but um, maybe I know change is hard, right? And driving change is, you, you have to constantly every day solve new problems, right? Um, but what are, just give our audience some of a sense of some of the challenges that you're facing in your work on a day-to-day -day basis that you're trying to overcome or you're working to solve here. Frisky, again, back to you to, to lead us off. That's a great question, John. May, maybe I'll talk related to our focus on coal transition and JEPI. A few years ago, talking about energy transition in Southeast Asia is like a taboo. Indonesia and Vietnam are even more sensitive because of their high dependence on the coal and the current role of the coal in their economic systems. I think now it's much better and the countries are open with energy transition as long as it doesn't hinder their economic growth. But I would see some challenges and some room for improvements on first, data availability. Most of Southeast Asia countries have one vertically integrated utility that handles all level of supply chains from generation to distribution. If we want to have a good output on our analysis, we should have a good and reliable data as the input. So to handle that, it is important to have a good stakeholder engagement and set an NDA or MOU with relevant stakeholder to access the data. Second, the various stakeholders in the government structure, for example, on the JEPP, we see there are at least three ministries and two state-owned enterprise are involved. So it's good to set stakeholder mapping and happy to say on for the JEPP, Indonesia will also create a JEPP secretariat, which consists of relevant stakeholders. Uh, and we are involved in this uh, discussion as well. The third one, policy challenges. It can be a bottleneck for market to enter or even the project because uh, the government or state-owned company actor can face in Indonesia like a lawsuit for possible state laws. So to address this, I believe we need to have like a close discussion with the government and stakeholders to perhaps do like policy reforms, which may take some time, but as long as the ownership coming from the government and there's a common goal, the government will support it. But lastly, the financial strength from the involved stakeholders. Uh, this is like, again, uh, emphasizing my previous point. This is like to address the gap between the amount of the finance needed and the amount currently available from the donors countries and the MDBs. This can be addressed by aligning the level of details and transparency uh, regarding the project pipelines and the financial projects uh, between the financial institution and the project developers. So to conclude, the transition plans in Southeast Asia need to adequately address the policy, technical, operational, and social impacts, uh, and all costs that come with that. So those are the challenges, but we have addressed that in our work in Southeast Asia. Thank you for, for laying that out, Rizky. It was no small feat, again, that, that we got to that $20 billion commitment. Of course, the the challenge of operationally delivering against that now and making sure that the next, uh, you know, kind of we move from commitment uh, to, to real steel in the ground and real financeable projects is, is the next level of, of challenge that kind of 
is going to take all four of those barriers being overcome yet again, right? Um, but Mahala, um, from your perspective, why don't we why don't we shift over? What are some of the challenges that you're addressing specifically? Yes, uh, you know, at one of the main challenges we are really trying to overcome at the Climate Finance Access Network is really how can we promote local talents? How can we make sure we build lasting capacity of local professionals? And really, we see there is a lack of recognition, especially from the donor community, that, you know, like investing in lasting capacity in the global south is really crucial. So we don't want to have a project by project basis kind of support, but really to make sure we establish a good infrastructure so that these countries will be able to access funding, not only in the short term, but also in the long term, and making sure that that capacity stays in the country and they are, you know, equipped to access funding. And really what we're also trying to see and also build upon the indigenous knowledge and making sure that it's country owned and really locally laid so that they feel the ownership and accountable to this uh, project and also the outcomes that they will achieve. And also from the climate justice perspective, we want to make sure that the most vulnerable and the, those who are the less capacitated ones are the ones who will be accessing funding. So yeah, so I think it's really about building the lasting capacity is the biggest challenge that we're really trying to overcome in this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahala. I mean, all change in the end is dependent upon individuals, right? And, and we need to help uh, support individuals to make the change through knowing what the choices are, right? The choices that fit for them in their individual uh, circumstances. And your team is doing just an amazing job of helping lay out the choices, the resources, the options, right, that, that exists there. Um, Rose, as you reflect on this this issue of challenge, what what comes to mind for you? What are you wrestling? Um, so for us, uh, oil and gas is traditionally an opaque industry. Uh, a lot of information are behind the corporate boundary, and but emission data is a public common. It's a commons good. We have to make those emissions data available so actions can be taken to remediate those um, climate impacts. Um, there's a saying that we can't manage what we can't measure, and this is never truer for oil and the gas. So the biggest challenge is the data availability to you know, carry out the kind of modeling we are doing with, um, we need production volume data for every oil and gas field. This is not that readily available. Not many companies or countries require the companies to publish those production volume data. Um, we currently are subscribing through a commercial database to access those production volume. But in our opinions, um, those data should be in the public domain so the public knows how much emissions are occurring at every basin. It's kind of like those breathing machines. We need to know how much carbon dioxide and methane are emitting at this moment to the atmosphere so we can have an accurate account of what's in the system and what kind of measures can be taken to get rid of those carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. So um, OCI Plus, Debbie Gordon, um, the author of the Standard Oil, uh, sorry, No Standard Oil, uh, started this project in 10 years. 10 years ago, and the whole goal of the project is to unveil the opacity of the uh, oil and gas emissions and to differentiate the emissions um, impact, the emissions from the different oil and gas resources. Thank you. Lots of technical and industry challenges there for us to overcome. And I know you've also, the team's been very creative about where data isn't forthcoming about using satellite and flyover data and information to supplement or, or to verify um, as part of our uh, uh, desire to ensure that all of this data is open source and available and helps people to choose, again, to choose the clean energy option uh, uh, in the end that makes the most sense. Um, I know you've all been listening listening patiently and there are lots of questions rolling in. I'm gonna invite back Jennifer Stokes here to, um, I know she's been monitoring uh, the, the, the channels and has at least some idea of what your, your areas of interest are. Jennifer, um, do you wanna lead us off and, and uh, jump back in here to help moderate? 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so thank you again. Please put your questions into the Q and A function, and we will start to answer, uh, start to kick them over to John and to our panelists. So one of the questions is around um, land use as it relates to renewable energy. And so as we think about the amount of space that the renewable energy projects will be taking up, how do we also at the same time ensure that we're protecting land as we are developing energy systems? So John, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, on that, so when we think about material intensity and that's the amount of uh, the amount of stuff we've got to dig up and move uh in order to to either build and and run a coal plant or to uh you know build and operate a solar field there's actually over a hundred and uh, two orders of magnitude over a hundred time difference in the amount of land and physical materials that you need to produce fossil fuels versus one one hundredth of that, more than one one hundredth, to produce the same amount of energy from renewables. And I think that that all stands to reason, right? When we think about um, we're using as the source of energy something that's flowing freely. And so it's just about converting that, whether it be in solar and wind or or other even batteries and, and chemical storage, right? Um, but it's far less material intensity intensive it's far less land intensive overall when we think about it as an option and that's a misconception that people have because they see big solar fields near frankly where the energy is needed but they don't see the big mountaintop removals or the the large you know kind of uh, additional cement or steel plants that are required to build massive uh fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, including rails and everything else that's required to move around coal, et cetera. So that's, you know, just important to note, put a pin in it for yourself as you think about that, just two orders of magnitude difference in terms of material efficiency um, when we can actually use the energy that's naturally occurring in our environment to begin with, rather than uh, digging up fossil fuels. Couple of questions that are that are coming in here around the partnerships and the collaborations, particularly related to OCI Plus. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about Carbon Trace, the consortium into OCI Plus, and how all of that data is flowing in and flowing out? Um, do you mean Climate Trace, Jennifer? Yes, I'm sorry, Climate Trace. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so Amai is a coalition member of Climate Trace, and we've been in Climate Trace Coalition for two years, and we are supplying the um, um, production and refinery emissions data to the Climate Trace Coalition uh, in the sense that OCI Plus is the uh, using a barrel forward approach to track the life cycle emissions of a barrel of oil or a barrel of oil equivalent of gas. The, the emissions along the supply chain of the oil and gas, while climate trace is more on the asset focus, like they are looking into what is the emission intensity or carbon intensity of every asset that is producing emissions. So they are looking into every refinery, every um, every um, oil production uh, production sites. So we um, OGSI uh, oil and gas solutions initiative team, we provide the oil and gas sector data to the Climate Trace Coalition. Great. And for those for those that don't know, Climate Trace is it's an amazing effort, right? It's it's about a dozen different institutions that have linked together to help map in real time the data globally of carbon and methane emissions. Because right now, all of our policies and all the global agreements that we have are really based on data that are three years old. Uh, and we're all looking in, we're driving forward, looking in our rearview mirror to figure out where exactly we stand. And through work of Rose and our other partners there, we're developing um, uh, a, a data set that is getting down now to the actual um, individual asset level. So to the power plant, to the, to the ship to the airplane that starts to document where in the world are these emissions coming from on a real-time basis and we're we're within a year now the goal is to get it within six hours and and uh just an amazing coalition an amazing um uh 
ability for many partners to come together and use data and digital technologies and machine learning in new and exciting ways. Questions coming in around uh, inclusivity and climate justice. And I know, John, this is a passion of yours. It's something that we're thinking of across the entire program portfolio. Um, how do governments continue to grow economic development while we're also taking into consideration issues around climate justice and equality in the energy transition? And what does this look like in the, the programs that we're talking about today? Yeah, I, so I'm going to turn it to, to Risky and Mahalat here in a moment because both of them are dealing with this firsthand, right? But, but we cannot get to 100% clean without being 100% inclusive, right? This is, a, this is a great moment for us to free ourselves from resource constraints, and we need to build systems that engage, that employ, that support where communities are involved in, again, choosing the energy transition that makes the most sense for them. And I know uh, Mahalat and Risky, you've both been thinking about this. Um, uh, Mahalat, do you wanna go first and just talk a little bit about how you're experiencing it and then over to you thereafter, Risky. Yeah, thank you, John. And thanks for the question. Yes, yeah, so as I have mentioned, it's really about when we, I mean, we talk about going clean and green and for this countries, it takes a lot. It's not only about the resources, but really changing the behavior and also the economy. There will be a lot of implications, social, economic, and other implications when going green or changing to a clean energy. So, but really what we also in what we have in our program and also what we also promote is really how do we make sure this transition is just, it's also inclusive and also making sure this is not only about cleaning or you know the transition is not only about the economy but also like how do we make sure we build resilience when we change you know when they are transitioning how do we make sure that the most vulnerable are actually building resilience of their economy and also their community so we make sure this is really the heart of our program and we make sure that it is done in a very inclusive and also just way thank you yeah, and thank you for the great question as well. So to add what Mahalat has mentioned, so basically there's a need to have like a, a, a inclusive discussion with the stakeholders, like for the energy transition in Indonesia and the Vietnam. So we include like all the stakeholders there from the government, utility, CSO, even also from the bankers and the private sectors. And like this is just energy transition for now it's only for the coal phase out, but what about the coal workers? What about the infected communities? So that's also what we want to include uh, on the discussion. So we actually have published a coal transition mechanisms guideline a few weeks ago, which addressed the three components on the coal transitions, which are the just energy transition, utility transition, and mobilizing transition capital from the lens of the financial, the policy, operational, and the people. So learning from Indonesia as an example, this is, can be replicated and scaled to the other countries, which will be a great target for the next JP, like in India or African countries. So I have that answer to the question as well. One question uh, that I think is a really interesting one is, is just how difficult is it to overcome that momentum for governments to use existing carbon emitting technologies? What, what are we seeing that it takes to move governments and corporates uh, fastest in order to make these transitions? Yeah, again, I'm gonna lean on you here a bit risky because you, you have the frontline experience of working with a government directly. I know I've been very much engaged with the senior leaders in Indonesia thinking about how, how exactly do they take a power system that has a tremendous amount of coal, right? Two thirds of, of the power system is coal right now. And they've built more that's gonna be coming online soon and need to transition that to renewables, which is now cheaper in effect to operate than the coal that they've already committed to. And it's a real challenge, even in a situation where it should be cheaper, there are contract obligations and you know, kind of uh, existing investors that need to be part of the conversation here. And it's one that you've navigated very carefully and very successfully, Risky. Um, 
what what would you say was kind of the secret on that front? So to be honest, for Indonesia, they just restart the discussion on the carbon markets. For now, yes, they are trying to find like anything can be like funding channel, like from the JP, from the MDBs. And one of the, the thing that they want to explore is the carbon trading and carbon finance. So actually, to be honest, this is like the start of the discussion. We just asked to support them on how to explore on the carbon uh, avoidance from the from the coal. So it's not like to retire and how much the, the cost or, or the funding that can they get from retire this coal. Uh, this is like will be difficult because they have to propose to the UNFCCC and it may take like maybe three to five years, but this is something that they want to explore for now. Uh, and as of now, uh, we are still on the initial phase in the country and the region. Thank you so much. So a question to come in, uh, just first of all, with a thank you from some of our audience for the different perspectives that are on the call, uh, but asking like, who's leading from a country perspective, where are we seeing some really great solutions that can be replicated in other places? Yeah, so if I think about, you know, kind of where we are in the energy transition, there are a few a, a few clear leaders and for different reasons right now, right? Um, but we are seeing uh, in particular on the, on the investment side, I, we cannot understate the impact of the um, Inflation Reduction Act and, and, and the joint uh, investment and um, uh, infrastructure bill alongside the CHIPS Act in the United States together those things all constitute more than a trillion dollars that the U.S. is investing specifically in helping to drive down the cost of clean energy. And the rest of the world will benefit from that. But I will say that part of the reason that the U.S. is doing that is because China has been so far ahead, right? They have, they have really um, taken this, this clean energy transition seriously for, uh, from the perspective of job creation, from the the raw need that it solves many of the challenges of, of urban pollution and growth, uh, that it solves energy security challenges, that it, it, it indeed addresses employment issues, et cetera. Um, and so there's the US did that to catch up to uh, China in effect, which, which has been a global leader and is uh, you know, putting out as much clean energy solution uh, um, you know, capital every year as the rest of the world combined, roughly, right? So it, it's that order of magnitude. Um, now that said, on the policy front, places like California, places like Europe, and its response specifically to to the horrible war that's going on in in Ukraine, right, um, has started to galvanize and push things forward faster. That give us strong hope here at RMI that this clean energy economy is emerging about 10 years faster than it would otherwise right now because of a number of different consequences related to that war, to the price spike in fossil fuels, to the need for the entire world to secure alternative production for energy and food supplies both. But I, I'd welcome any reflections from my colleagues here if they have thoughts on who who is who is leading from your perspective that you look to in your in your different areas um, that you'd want to share? I'll start first, sure. Yeah, but uh, I can speak for the Southeast Asia, uh, specifically for Indonesia, still and Vietnam, still for the Southeast Asia countries. The the driver seats are coming from the government and the utilities, so. But as we can see from the JP, even from the government structure, there are like three ministries and two state-owned companies, which are like utility and the financial state-owned companies. So in Southeast Asia, again, because of the high, uh, like the vertically integrated, the the still uh, like a drive uh, driver seat from the government. So still, those are the key players in 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 the country in the any regions. CSO is not really seen as kind of like I can influence the policy, but sometimes they can also seen as like an enemy. So, but yeah, uh, but they can also be like a, another partner to as a discussion partner for the think tank. 
Thanks, Risky. Yeah, maybe back to you, Jennifer. Yeah, well, as we uh, we near the end of our time, I want to thank all of the panelists for sharing your perspectives. John, thank you for launching our first uh, big webinar of your CEO ship. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a number of questions that we weren't able to get to in the conversation. Uh, which we will answer and share back with anybody who asked those questions. We also will be sharing a recording um, of this. And as we do enter towards the end of the year, uh, we are able to do at RMI um, what we do because of your support and your partnership on the ground. 90% of the revenue that supports RMI comes from philanthropy, and that is from gifts large and small. And so we do have a special acceleration challenge in place for the next 48 hours. We have a donor that is supporting all gifts to RMI. We'll be matching those gifts dollar for dollar up to $25,000. Again, thanks to our acceleration challenge donors. And so if you've liked what you've heard, you wanna play a role in helping us create a clean, prosperous and secure low carbon future, please consider making a gift to RMI at rmi.org slash give. And again, thank you to our panelists for joining. Thank you, John, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful day and see you next time.